Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby, a.k.a. DDP from the Dallas Prospect, and I am joined again by my distant co-host. It has been so long, but Mavs okay. fast break rides again. <laughs> Any and Duca in the house. Any, how are you doing? Man, I am doing fantastic. It's good to be back uh, with updated equipment. Look at this, guys. I have my own setup. Uh, learn from the, the master best. over here. Yeah, it Talk is the best Academy setup and mic bit. you've had for sure. I'm I'm impressed. You got the same mic and everything. We're twinsies. Yeah, yeah. I learn from learn from the best. But hey, it's been a it's been a crazy uh, crazy uh, season. Um, but especially that that last day that was nutsos. But you know, it's definitely cool to talk about playoff basketball because, like we said last year, these are where legends are made. Mm -hmm. um legends are not made in the regular seasons they are made in off seasons we don't talk about Dirk and what he did in the regular seasons we talk about all the great stuff he did in the off seasons and all the memories and cool stuff like that so here's to making more memories again well they're gonna have a tough road to do it because one, it's been a minute since we've accomplished anything in the postseason. It's been oh, yeah. 10 years now since we won a playoff series, that obviously being the finals. Uh, and it's been so 10 years since we won a playoff series. And how long has it been? Like, I know we went to six games last year. The last time we really threatened was 2014 against the Spurs. We went to game seven. It's like Do we had the one year with a six game finish maybe two years in there that were a six game finish. And then like the one seven game series, other than that, the other playoff appearances were largely like here's five games here. You know what I mean? Like it, it's tough sledding post title is what I'm trying to say here. So yeah, it's uh it's, it's good to feel like you have a team that at the very least is on an upward swing. It's not like all those years where they were just cobbling together these veteran rosters of, you know, your Darren Williamses and guys like that and saying like, we think this team can. No, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> you just you're in denial. <laughs> that, that's where we're at. So it feels good knowing that you have a team that's at least on an upward swing. But it is a weird situation where even as we stand now, the 72 game regular season is done. Right. By the time you're 72 games through a season, you generally think like I damn well know my team. I don't know this team. <laughs> like <laughs> this team plays up or down to its competition and it's so like some nights it's really really good. It can get after the best teams in this league whether you know when they played the Nets they they smothered them all over them. They can mm -hmm. go into you know and I know Nick fans would be thrilled to hear this but into a, a place like Madison Square Garden against a good defensive team and hold them down, I think, to like 86 points or something like that when they matched up. Yep. So they can do things like this, and you look at it, and you're like, yes, that passes the eye test. This team looks like they can actually beat anybody. Mm -hmm. The problem, as it's been pointed out in previous videos, live streams, all that, is they can also be beaten by anybody on any given night. <laughs> Thank God the Sacramento Kings are not in the playoffs because if they were, just it's a sweep. It's over. We're done. <laughs> I feel like the Sacramento Kings was uh, our Golden State Warriors of 20, uh, 2007. Oh, uh, the we believe. Even though, even though, even though the, the Kings didn't even make it <laughs> into the playoffs, but for some reason there's something about that team that we just couldn't deal with. Yeah, no, I, I, I can't. I, I, by the time they got to the third matchup, I was like, all right, surely now they they understand, <laughs> right? They they get it. And the answer is no, no, they did not. No. So yeah, that was that was brutal. But this team did finish hot. I think they won like twelve of their final sixteen. Three of those games mm -hmm. came against, um, and you know, three of those losses came against the Kings, as we just talked about. Then I guess there was actually another one, too, because they lost to Memphis, where they got blown out in the second half, ran out of gas in that game. And then the the finale, which you could tell by the midpoint of the first quarter, they were just like, nah, we're done here. <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not going to go all out. Although they made a little bit of a push. Like, I think they missed their first 11 threes and then made something like 12 of the next 16. But it, it was already done deal. Once you're down 20 points in that case, you're not going to go all out to try and win that game. So yeah, it's a, it's a very perplexing team. And as we were talking about before we started recording here, both of these teams are different, even though you're matching up with the Clippers again, these are two very different teams than last year. I wrote about it a little bit 
uh, earlier this week for the website, just kind of talking about the matchup and who I think some of the big X factors are going to be. To me, two of the most important guys are going to be Jalen Brunson and Dwight Powell. That being because, one, you didn't have them last year. Two, Dallas as a team was actually better record-wise and defensively last year before Powell went down. Yes, KP unlocked himself after the injury when he moved to the five, but the team as a whole played better when they had both of them and they were better defensively. Their defensive rating last year fell off after the Powell injury. So I think that kind of gets overlooked because KP finally kind of reclaimed that old form a little bit. And I, as a result, I, I think that Powell, especially now in the last month, he looks like he's kind of back to pre Achilles injury, Dwight Powell. I think that is huge for this team because he is a more agile defender. KP guarding on the perimeter, not good, not good. <laughs> We've seen plenty of that this year to further affirm that belief. And a team like the Clippers, they're going to want to spread you out, right? They're going to want to throw Marcus Morris at him or someone like that that tries to pull him away from the basket where he is a good defender and put him in those situations. But when you have someone like Powell out there, Powell, I'm not saying Powell's a great defender by any means, but he is a hard-nosed defender, and he is more he's, agile he's than KP. He's an energy guy. He's at least yes. good at the very, at the very least, he's going to put forth the effort to make something happen. And yeah, I am, I am excited to see uh, kind of the Dwight Powell of, of I want to say old, but he was younger, but whatever, <laughs> but of old kind of come back. Uh, yeah. It's a sight to see because you know we were, um, you know, our offense was great, even though we had. Um, you know, Dwight and KP in, and we kind of were trying to figure out how that would work last year. But, uh, I mean, he's the type of guy that he's a great finisher around the rim. Um, he doesn't provide much outside <laughs> outside anything in there, but he's <clears throat> he's committed to his role. He knows his role. Mm-hmm. He knows what he's capable of doing. And, and having guys like that in your rotation can be big time. So, uh, I mean, if anything else, if anything, it, it's it's another body um, that we, that is serviceable, um, in this, in this playoffs, um, right. you know, we wouldn't have to rely on Boban as much as I love the guy. <laughs> he's an awesome character. Yeah. He's a very friendly dude. And I think he, he can be vital to, to a, a team that's looking to be successful in the long run. He just, we can't rely on him playing heavy minutes like we did last year. Yeah. So having Dwight back is definitely welcomed. Yeah. And I also highlighted uh, Jalen Brunson. Obviously, he was out with a torn rotator cuff last year. Now, they did pick up Trey Burke right before the NBA restart in the bubble. And Burke was solid for them all throughout the bubble. In fact, in the playoff series against the Clippers, he was quite good. 43% from three. He was playing about 26 minutes a game. That's more than you really want to have to play Trey Burke. But he was playing well enough that it was more acceptable I guess in that you're, you're willing to live with it as long as he's playing at that level. And he was a second scorer off the bench, which was vital, but he is also a score first point guard. When he tried in the past to not be a score first point guard, tried to be more of a distributor, he nearly ran himself out of the league. So yeah. it, it's a good weapon to have in your, in your arsenal for sure. But I would rather have Jalen Brunson because if you compare Brunson's stats this year to what Burke did in the bubble, they're very comparable. Like both guys are like 12.3 points. Now Brunson posted career highs and field goal percentage, I think like 52% and uh, three point percentage over 40%. So in fact, the only reason he missed 50, 40, 90 is because he was an 80% free throw shooter. So Brunson had a career best year in that regard, but I like, I think he's a better all around defender, even though Burke can get you those energy steals and things like that. And I think he's better in the sense that he's more of a distributor. And I think he can run the flow of an offense. Whereas Burke is like, I can energize you by scoring for myself and that just pump you up that we're doing something. But like Brunson's like, no, I can set you up and I can keep everything running smoothly so that we're in the flow we need to be while Luca's getting rest or while he's at least playing off ball. So I think Brunson is still an upgrade in that regard and not having him last year, I thought was huge. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I'm not sure if you have the numbers because I definitely don't Uh, because you're, you're better at this than I am. But uh, I know the the numbers when Luca and Brunson are on the floor. Do you do you happen to know that? I don't have that uh, in front of me, but I did see it. Uh, I think yeah, uh, if I remember correctly, ago. it's pretty high up there. And yeah. so I mean, Burke was 
I don't want to say great, but he was definitely really good for us last year. Mm-hmm. And Brunson has been good for us this year. So it is, it is good to have both of them. Uh, he's, he's definitely going to be uh, something that, you know, if, if uh, you no know, Clippers are looking at what happened last year, you know, and they're preparing for this team, they're not going to be dumb enough to just completely solely look at what happened last year. But having to pay attention to a guy like Brunson, who can be an extension, who can be, who can be that, other playmaker that we solely need sometimes mm-hmm. for you know Luca to get some rest because we don't want Luca to have to do everything on offense. He has to set up everybody too. Um, you know Brunson can definitely handle some of that burden, uh, set up some guys, get some for himself. Uh, be he's a tough dude to guard. He has great handles and stuff like that. He also turned into a fantastic finisher. But I where did I hear that he was like you know amongst the top. Uh, has amongst the top field goal percentage around the rim or something like that. Who, Brunson? Yeah, Brunson. It was pretty high up. I don't he must know. have been I mean, in the Mavs broadcast one night or probably something. Probably something like that. Yeah, but follow well. You know, he's, he's been stats. he's been pretty yeah he's been pretty impressive this year. Uh, so I'm definitely excited to see uh, what he can bring to us for his first uh, playoff performance. And also too, there's a lot of guys who are trending upwards mm-hmm. towards the end of the year. Yeah, that yeah. I'm. You know, hopefully they, if they can keep it going there in this playoffs can make us really dangerous. You know, we saw a lot of uh, uh, Tim Hardway. He turned it on uh, at the end of the season. Hopefully, um, you know, it's something that we unlocked and he can keep going. Um, hopefully Mark Cuban is giving his dad fresh tickets courtside. Uh, so that man yeah. could put up 30, 40 points a game. And invited his <laughs> grandmother to every game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. He, he was actually on uh, he was on JJ Reddick's podcast yeah. uh, that yeah. dropped today. And he mentioned that. And it was just like, I don't understand why Mark Cuban playing around. You better fly down for yeah. Tim Hardaway. Has sit him down courtside uh, and, you know, get the best out of uh, THJ every night. Um, Dorian Finney-Smith. He he definitely came on at the end. He's definitely more consistent shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully, he can keep that up again. Uh, you know, of course, we talked about Dwight Powell and how he's you know basically making this comeback. So if we can have you know those people maintain the their contributions that they ended the season with, you know, is definitely something that you know the the Clippers have to worry about. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's not something yeah. that hey, we all we got to do is stop Luca and then we got them or stop Luca and KP or limit them, whatever. Like, cause these guys to Luca, first of all, Luca is a type of dude that uh, there's, there's no really one way to stop Luca. Cause mm-hmm. you really can't double team him. Cause if you double team him, he will pick you apart. Him and Jokic and LeBron are kind of the, you know, one of the few people uh, in the league that can handle that. So if other people are, are stepping up because we've seen time and time again, Luca's making those great passes in the corner, you know, those skip passes in the corner of the of the three point line, and these guys are missing wide open threes. We can't have that, you yeah. know, if we we're looking to advance. Um, so, you know, with these guys stepping up, Brunson, of course, shooting forty percent, all that, man. I mean, it Mavericks can be a problem. I'm seeing all over YouTube, all over whatever. Of course, like the national people are saying. You know, Clippers and six or whatever. You know, right. like but there's a lot of people like saying out of that. Fifteen experts picked the Clippers. Yeah, and, and the one guy that picked wasn't even the Dallas guy. It was Royce Young. <laughs> yeah, he was an Oklahoma guy, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, and so uh, I know, but I'm seeing a lot of like YouTubers, and this don't mean nothing, but you, you sure. know, I mean, this people who you know their brand is to watch the NBA mm-hmm. uh, and come up with opinions. And they're saying, you know, the, a dark horse based on what they're seeing at the end of the year is the Mavericks. Yeah. Um, and if you can get everyone unlocked, we're, you know, if we, the, the goal is this is this is how I look at it. Um, can in, until we've truly built a tighter, a title contender, mm-hmm. can we at least have a team that if everything is rolling, is capable of. You know, I don't want to say title. Yeah. But if everything is rolling to its most optimum level, then how far can we go? And I think the Mavericks, if that's the case this year, they can they can probably find a way to go to maybe conference finals. If everything is rolling at its most, I don't want your people on your thing to be like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I, was like, I know what I'm talking about. but Because it, it's kind of like 2011, right? Right. That team wasn't necessarily viewed as a They were the contender. third best team in the West. 
yeah, they're they're the third. They were ranked third, but mm-hmm. you know, even even the six sixth place Trailblazers were gaining more love uh, than the 2011 Mavs, especially but, once the Mavericks blew that 2-0 lead. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and then once uh, Brandon Roy put up 40 to tie up the series, but um, you know, they ran at such an optimum level that they were unstoppable. Yeah. Now yeah. they weren't they weren't contenders to a point where hey, let's bring this team back, but. They, it, how they ran was for that span in time for those 16 plus plus. I don't know. I can't do math off the top of my head, but at least 16 wins, right? Like, yeah, lost two, yeah, 16 swept, wins. lost one, lost two. So they went like 16 and five. Yeah, 16 and five throughout the postseason. All right, cool. Exactly. I so, can do you basic know, math and add so up for to those five 20, losses. For those 21 games, <laughs> mm-hmm. Can they run at a, at a level that is so efficient on offense that they were able to win a championship like the 2011 Maps? Or can we go to the you know conference finals like the Blazers did a couple of years ago? Sure. And stuff like that. As we're, as we're building. Or like the 2011 OKC Thunder, as they were making their way up, you know, they went from going losing to the Lakers in, uh, they got, uh, the year before. Swept. Yeah, they lost in game six the year before. Yeah, to the Lakers, the and then completely skipped everything and just went to the conference finals, yep. lost to the Mavs, and then the next year went to the finals and lost to the Heat. Mm-hmm. So can the Mavericks do that? That's what that's what uh, I'm waiting to see. And in my mind, if Luka can get everyone going and if everyone's running at the peak levels, that is probably what we are most capable of doing is probably conference side. I, I conference. think this team has the offensive firepower for sure. Like, yeah. I, I think, you know, you mentioned Jalen Brunson. Well, I mentioned him, then you added on to it. But Jalen Brunson's <laughs> three-point shooting this year. I'm pretty sure been, you, you've you mentioned everyone, and I just kind of, you know, wrote on your coattail. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. But, uh, yeah, Jalen Brunson's three-point shooting. I, I think Maxi and Dorian Finney-Smith, in fact, that's the next article I'm writing, is about the Mavericks developmental system because the development of those two undrafted guys to what they are now, and I, and I know we just talked about Maxi. I think we talked about before we actually started recording, but Maxi's Achilles is the red flag for us, the sore Achilles that even as I was writing articles at the start of the week, I didn't put as much concern into it. And as we've gotten further into the week and kind of seen like, no, no, this is a red flag that they're watching. They don't doubt that he'll be able to play. The question is how effective will he be? And it's like, ooh, okay, because I referenced them at near full health. That's a red flag, but the development of two undrafted guys in Dorian Finney-Smith and Maxie. And in Dorian's case, particularly the last two years, he went from a guy that couldn't throw it into the ocean if his toes were in the sand. And (laughs) now the last two years, I think last year he ended up shooting like 39%. This year he's over 40%. Maxie got $150,000 Ross, or not roster bonus, but a bonus, incentive bonus for shooting over 40% this year. So Mm -hmm. these two guys have really become two of the best contract 3 and D guys in the league. And there's a reason why the past two years Dallas has received calls about them at the trade deadline because people are like, hey, these are exactly the kind of guys we want to pick up. Really good 3 and D guys that are stupid cheap. Dorian Finney-Smith mm-hmm. is due for a much bigger payday here. Um, it, I don't know if it would be this offseason or the next, but he's he's making only like $4 million a year. I think he signed like a 4 I for 16. It's, prob- it's next, I believe. Okay. So, But yeah. you've got guys like that that are capable shooters. Really the one thing you didn't have – and as you relate to the 2011 team, is the guy that can run around and come off screens, which brings to the other red flag health wise for the Mavericks right now, JJ Redick. What is his situation uh, as his Achilles soreness has kept him out? I didn't see his recent podcast thing. I don't know if you got any insight into that about how he feels and if he's going to be ready, but he's the only guy that can do that kind of thing where he's just running you like crazy as a defender off of curl screens where he can operate off the dribble, not just step back, but you know, clear out from a guy. It's not all just catch and shoot like a lot of these other Maverick players are for shooting threes, but the Mavericks have the firepower offensively. The question to me is what are their role players able to do? Because I think Luca will be great. In fact, I think Luca will be better than last year. That's the article I wrote about today. The aspect of his game he added that as much as people wanted to highlight, hey, he needs to become a better three-point shooter, and he did, what he added to his game, other than that, that's more valuable, and we talked about this, I think, last year when the uh, the season wrapped up, that mid-range game. Because 
he he went from and again all the stats are in the article if you want to check that out and anyone listening to this want to check that out it's on the website the dallas his his efficiency there his usage rate is three times higher than last regular season in that regard. Mm. He went from 7% to 21% usage. His efficiency last year against the Clippers shooting mid-rangers in the, in the first round was 36% conversion. He's up over 50% in the regular season this year. So Jeez. he's had substantial growth, not just in usage, but in conversion. And last year, if it wasn't a step back three, basically, because we know he loves to take the more difficult three point shots anyway, if it wasn't a step back three, he had to go all the way to the basket and get clobbered. And he got mercilessly beat on in that series. And so the fact that now he can operate in that middle ground and it's not just, oh, he put the ball on the deck. I just got to retreat back to the basket and let my collapsing uh, defense, help defense come over and smother Mm -hmm. him. Now that you can't just think about that and you have to worry about that mid-range game where he is suddenly turning into a bona fide assassin, he is damn near unguardable. The fact that he also added the three-point shot, career high 35 percent this year and if Mm -hmm. you take out the first month of the season he's better than that because we know how bad he started out shooting threes to start the year he is damn near unguardable if his shot's falling at all it's already nearly game over but to me the role players are going to be what steps up like what has to step up for this to for this to work because you referenced it earlier how many times does he drive and kick to an open man and he misses the three yeah and that we have to definitely limit that. And to the man, to the point for the for the midi Luca as I as I'm going to coin, uh, it's definitely a sight to see because we when it comes down, we you know we talk about all the analyticals and stuff like that. But in my philosophy, when when we get to the playoff time, you know, throw all the analytics out. Who who can get buckets? Mm-hmm. When, especially when it matters most. We see it. Uh, we saw it last year with Garden Kawhi. We, you know we've. We've been seeing it for the last how many years watching Dirk. You know, at the end of the game, I don't care about numbers. I know threes are worth more than twos, but we just need that ball to go through the bucket. And if you can add in a mid-range game, you're as good as Luka can at getting to the rim and he has improved in shooting the three. There's no point in the court where his man that's the guardian can be comfortable. Right. There's none. And, of course, he can also... Uh, you know, sling that ball around. So, you know, literally there's no point in, especially when, you know, the game slows down in the, in the half court yeah. where if Luca has the ball, it's definitely, you know, some, something can happen. You know, like, Oh, if this person has the ball. This is, this, these are the possible outcomes. He can either shoot it or he's going to like, if Dwight gets the ball, He's gonna either look to pass it or whatever. If Tim has the ball, he's probably Tim Hardaway has the ball. He's probably gonna shoot it. Probably, probably. <laughs> he's probably gonna shoot it. He doesn't care where the defense is. Um, so just try to get in the space as possible. But if Luca has the ball, what are you gonna do? There's right. no, there's no, no real game plan. It's hey, right. This is how this is how mid range unlocking mid range Luca. This is what the effect of that can be. You remember. Of course, back in 2011, and I'm sure people remember, but when Dirk was playing against, when Dirk was playing against the Thunder, mm-hmm. and we saw we saw uh, the coach wired, and we got to look at, we got to hear what Scott Brooks was saying to the to the Thunder. What did he say, Dirk Nowitzki? He's gonna do what he's gonna do. Yeah, <laughs> like there's not, there's literally, he was literally telling his guys, look, there's nothing we can do about that. Right. Got to put effort. Hope he misses it. And if Luca can, if Luca can, you know, get into that bag, we can be in any game. But you, like you said, um, Tim Hardaway, Brunson. If we can get Kleba, if he can be healthy enough to come back, and the real, the real X factor is KP and his health. Yeah, really. Yeah. If we can get both, if we can get Bubble KP with good health, we can win the series. If you get bubble KP with the improvements of the roster otherwise, I think you have a team mm-hmm. that can go to the conference finals like you were talking about. Yeah. I, I like this team last year, I think the only reason they didn't win the series last year is because they lost KP. And yeah. this year they've had to play without KP so much that I think they're better equipped to deal without him now. And that's not to say that their ceiling is higher. It's certainly not. If you have KP yeah. and he's playing 
peak KP unicorn levels, then yes, your ceiling is as high as it's going to go in that case. But you've played without him so much this year that I don't think they fear having to play without him. I think they're yeah. just like, all right, well, here we go, because they've had games like that. Like when he went down last year and they lost him after game three, I think that was a little bit of a shock to the team because it was like, oh, dude, we were already under like under um, under the gun, so to speak, you know, outmanned, mm. outgunned. And now we just lost one of our two dudes and he's been playing out of his mind. This is a big yeah. blow to the team. First team all bubble. Exactly. <laughs> the most <laughs> pointless credential or whatever <laughs> ever. But yes, um, losing bubble KP, I think was devastating to the team last year. Yeah. This year they've had to go so much without him. And even when he's been here, I mean, we'll be, I'll be frank, like he's been so up and down, so wildly inconsistent that mm. if he puts forth a good game and you don't win, you're like, damn, that feels like we wasted it, you know? Like, yeah. we wasted it like figgy pudding. Like, you just don't do that, man. You got to capitalize. <laughs> and so for that situation, it's like they've played so much either without him or with him there but not on, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, just not quite clicking, that I think they just kind of roll with it now. They're just like, whatever. Like, we, we've gotten, we've dealt with this all year. All these guys got these minutes and got this experience and, you know, we'll we'll handle it as we have to. But you're right that for Dallas to have its best chance to move forward through this, they need some facsimile of bubble KP back. They need some measure of that. And I don't know if we're going to get that because bubble KP was off of a two month layoff of just being able to work out and stay working at his game and Mm -hmm. everything. It was also then an eight game regular season restart to really ramp up. I know he hit the ground running pretty quick. Obviously, as you said, all bubble first team, but it's still different than coming back and playing in two or three games and playing pretty well in two of them and really admittedly really well in one of them. It's, it's just different. I feel like, but we'll see. I mean, if he can, if he can string it together, great. Cause that this team really needs, really needs him to do it. I mean, they, their hands are very full this year. I will say we've been talking a lot about the Mavericks, obviously. I will say as it relates to the Clippers, I think that they they were very bold in their tanking against the Rockets and Thunder, literally yeah. the two worst records in the Western Conference. Whether they would tell you it's because they didn't want the Lakers in the first round, which, by the way, I'm never going to pick the team that admittedly that like isn't going to hide the fact that they're running from an, a matchup, you know, like I'm never going to take that team seriously. Even, even as a champion, potentially I'm never going to yeah. take them seriously. If it's like, dude, don't brag. You, you admitted you ran away from it. You tanked against the two <laughs> tankingest teams in the Western conference. So you wouldn't play them. Like they out, they that's already bad enough. You lose all respect. <laughs> You're in the territory <laughs> of Kevin Durant championships. You don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but the fact that they tank that and they make that move to draw the Mavericks for a rematch, I uh-huh. guarantee you that that resonates in the Mavericks locker room. Not only do they know and remember last year, not only are they motivated to prove something, not just in the playoffs again, oh, it's the same team as well, and they did what? Because they thought we were their best matchup? Oh, mother. Like, I think that this team is incredibly motivated coming into this matchup. Now, it's a different Clipper team. Doc Rivers is gone. Obviously, he's in Philadelphia now. They're the number one seed in the East. That's good. We know Doc River teams have a very hard-nosed, uh, physical, shall we say, dirty identity. And, yes, they yep. still have guys like Morris. Obviously, that's going to get a lot of play as well. But it's a different team. Lou Williams is gone. Montrez Harrell is gone. And I do think they actually managed to – not upgrade in scoring, but they took two guys that were defensive liabilities and actually made themselves better by plugging those holes. And so it's an interesting matchup in that regard. It's a very different Clipper team. I still think they're a very good defensive team. Obviously, they're in the top 10 in both offense and defense. Yeah. But best, shooting, Mavis, uh, best three point shooting team in the league. Of, in yes. My, of best three point percentage in the league. And the Mavericks <clears throat> in guarding the three, I think, were like 13th in the league so like it's not not great in that regard it's not a good recipe and like i said 
the Mavericks had talked about how they like to run. I think Carlisle said it recently. They like the idea, even though KP has talked about how now he prefers the five instead of the four. Carlisle's like, well, we've done all this research and everything all year. We've looked at this. It makes sense. Our best lineup is when we have two bigs out there. Well, they're going to try and spread you out by going a little bit small ball. They're going to want to put Morris out there to try and drift KP or whoever away from the basket. And so they're going to attack what your strength is. And so how can you adapt? This is where it gets into a chess match. I think that Carlisle is the better coach in this case. Yeah. But I still think that it's a very good Clippers team that top to bottom is still going to give you problems. I don't know if this Clippers team is better than last year. I think on paper they filled some of their weaknesses. And so you would want to say yes. It's a, it's a different, in my, my opinion, um, with the addition of Ibaka, Luke Kennard and the subtractions of <clears throat> of uh, Montrez. You and know, let, Williams, let's yeah. talk about the the swapping of Montrez for Ibaka. I don't think Montrez all around is a better player. Mm-hmm. Than Six Ibaka, man of the year but, last year. Yeah, but Serge is a better fit for what um, what the Clippers are trying to do. And another thing that worries me about the Clippers, and we, we cannot sleep on the addition of Rondo into that mix. Now, I will not I'm wear not, another jersey. <laughs> no, we're, we're not, we're not going to make you do that, Derek. You worked so hard this year. We can't, we can't bring, bring that back. I can't, I can't um, relive the memories, yeah, man, even um, though it's literally part of the intro, me ripping the, lawn, uh, the Rondo <laughs> jersey. So, I mean, we saw what Rondo did for the Lakers last year. He wasn't very good for them in the regular season, but come playoff time, he was probably the third best player um, in the bubble. So, and what we saw from the Clippers during the offseason, they were clamoring for a a playmaking type point guard. Um, Patrick Beverly wasn't that. He's not that. He's a more of a, I'm a three and D type point guard. We need someone who can, another playmaker score type um, to play around me. I'm just going to, you know, guard the best, you know, the other team's point guard and probably give them as much hell as I possibly can. Um, But Rondo is someone that can play defense on the other end and also set up guys like Kawhi, guys like Paul. Um, So that's kind of the thing that's kind of worrying me about the, about the, um, about this series. And another thing is, uh, is Paul George. Now we all know he has the, uh, he has the, um, I guess, the stigma of, you know, he's never really Pandemic gets up Paul. in the playoffs. And, and yeah, in hindsight, yeah, that's definitely true. He definitely didn't uh, play up to what he's capable of last year and the year before and the year before that. But the thing is, you cannot, you can't prepare for that. You can't count on that. And even if he's having a bad game, you can't be like, okay, Pandemic P is back. Let's, you know, put sure. a weaker defender on him and use – are better defensive resources elsewhere. No, you can't, you can't sleep on them. If Paul George is on the floor, you have to respect him. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Kawhi, that's just, you know, it's Kawhi. He's a great defender, great scorer, uses the mid range. He's a threat, three level scorer. Um, You know, so these are kind of the things that, uh, you know, we're definitely, I'm definitely worried about um, in terms of matchups and how, how, what, what resources are we going to use defensively? Uh, to kind of mitigate, you know, Kawhi to mitigate Paul George. Mm-hmm. Um, what are other what are other threats? I know we had like Luca on Marcus Morris last year. Yeah. Um, what are, like what are we going to do for the and other Morris, guys? I think Morris tore us up last year too. He did. Yeah, and we damn Over near lost from three. We damn near lost game four in. Um, if it wasn't for Luca's crazy step back thirty foot yep. three point, which I still. I, I'm excited that shot went in, mm-hmm. but that was a bad shot. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it, it's it's one of those that's things. A, he's he's always going to take that really yeah, tough drawn up shot. That's and that's you want yeah, him going like, towards the basket, but yeah, that's that's just what he's going to do. So I remember I remember exactly where I was. I was at home watching that game, and I, when he when he did it because he kind of did the the crossover, mm-hmm. and I'm like. Don't do it, guy. We're down by one point. We don't need a three-pointer. We just need, you know, rise up and make the mid-range. You know what I mean? 
he did it and no. I was like, God that dang was, it. And he made it. I was like, let's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he made it. And I was just like, let's freaking God. Yeah. The other word. One, I was one so thing, hyped. One thing right. with uh, the Clippers and their defense and everything last year, I mentioned how during the regular season, Luca only took 7% of his shots in the mid range last year. In the mm-hmm. playoff series, they forced him to take 17% of his shots in that range. So yeah. they, they bothered him because eventually they wore him down enough with the physicality that human nature, he started trying to take, like, all right, I can't get the step back three or I'm a little gassed. Let me at least try and get something in the mid-range and not take quite the same punishment. And again, mm-hmm. he was converting only 36% of those shots in that series, which was actually, I think, down just a little bit from the regular season. So, like, he was taking more of them and doing okay as it related to the regular season by comparison, but, like, he, he wasn't strong in that area before. And so that's going to be a huge thing now for him as if he can do that because the Clippers still have a lot of that length and athleticism and defense. I don't know if they have quite the same identity again with the head coach shift, but it is something to keep an eye on is how, how this team responds to the physicality of it. And that's again, why I think Brunson is so important because I think Brunson is very mentally tough in that regard. And I think he's unfazed by a lot of that sort of thing. So we'll see what these guys are able to bring to the table. It's going to be a very interesting series. I think in a lot of ways, as different as it feels, I think it's also going to be, I think you're going to see a lot of similar things in that these are very close games. The Mavericks were much better in the regular season against them this year. They won two of the three games, had a 50-point yep. win, or I think a 51-point win. 50, yeah, 51 points. Yeah, and then uh, 16 or 17 points in the other game, and their one loss was by 10. And, uh, you know it's been up and down with how these guys have performed against the Clippers, right? Like I highlighted Brunson, his numbers weren't stellar against them this year. I think it's more of the intangibles that he brings to the, brings to the team in this regard. I'm banking on him elevating his game a little bit. Cause if you look at the analytics of, or the box scores of how he fared against the Clippers this year, it's not a lot to write home about, but I do think that the leadership and the toughness in that regard is going to be something that last year's team just sorely missed. Last year's team didn't have, you know, Willie Cauley-Stein opts out. You lose KP after game three. You don't have Brunson. You don't have the White Powell. Like, the team was very shallow. Josh Richardson wasn't on the team. Right. You you had Curry, who had a good series. but he had, uh, Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you had times when Curry was guarding Kawhi. That's just not a <laughs> recipe for, for success on the defensive end. Yeah, but nothing <laughs> beats least. when uh, Curry would score on Paul George and then flex on him, and we just know the backstory and everything there, and it's just like, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. It, as as different as it feels on paper compared to last year, like the rosters, I think the results are going to be quite similar. I still think it's a six-game series. Who wins? I don't know. I think this Mavericks team of the decade that we've been waiting for a playoff series win. I think this is the most equipped team to do it. And I'll say that even though the 14 team as an eight seed took the eventual champion Spurs to game seven, that team was playing way over its head. Like that was, that was smoke and mirrors. Carlisle at his best making that team work. And they finally just ran out of gas. This team actually is equipped where you look at it and you say, not only do I think they could win this series, I think they're capable Uh, of getting hot and actually making noise in the next round. You know, I don't know how far they go, but we've seen they are capable of beating anybody this year. And good news about the playoffs, as bad as you were against sub-500 teams, there aren't any anymore. (laughs) Nope, there's none in the playoffs. Well, actually, you know what? Order the Grizzlies. Grizzlies are the nine seed, 9-10. The Grizzlies just beat the Spurs as we were recording this. So that's the 9-10. So I guess theoretically, you still have a sub-500 floating in the wings. But yeah, uh, we definitely got our butts whooped against the Grizzlies this year. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, that's that's pretty much the good news of the playoffs is, especially in the Western Conference, you don't really have to worry about sub five hundred teams wrecking <laughs> your team. If you're good against the better teams, good news. That's all you're gonna see. Yeah. Uh, the Grizzlies. You know what? Let, let me I, ask I, you. I'd a be question. smirched the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies are thirty eight and thirty four. I besmirched their good name. Oh, so they're okay. So they're above five hundred, which means that we they're should still, do better anyway. For some reason, they're still for some reason our kryptonite. Um, they're like a whole team of uh, Maverick killers. But anyway, yeah. Let me ask yeah. you a question. What What are, in your opinion, what do you think is the best five for the Clippers, and how do you think we match up against? The be- them? Are you talking about like who the Clippers would start? End. 
Re- repeat that one more time. Who? What is the best five to end the game if you're the Clippers? Oh, the closers for the Clippers. Yeah. Let me here. I want to take a look here. I mean, obviously, you're. I think it will be probably Rondo at the one. Mm-hmm. Paul and Kawhi, Morris and Serge. Yeah, I, I think that's probably about what I would go. Obviously, your top two aren't going to be any question. Rondo, as much as I hate that this is a thing, playoff Rondo is a real thing. He just didn't yep. want to play that one year and uh, that year in Dallas. So last year he was garbage in the regular season for the Lakers, and then he was a much better player in the postseason. So I imagine we'll probably get another healthy dose of that. We'll see a pretty good Rajon Rondo in this. He'll probably, like you said, close as a result. And so your top three will be that. I think Morris for his defense um, in that regard. And, and yeah, Baca, I think that's a pretty fair I think that's a pretty fair thing. I'll tell you a, an X factor I, I kind of do worry about in this series just because we know how front court players have manhandled the Mavericks this year, and this guy in particular did it too. Mm. Boogie Cousins is going to be a thorn in our oh side, my I gosh, think. Oh, gosh, yeah. I think that he is such a scoop off the street for nothing for them, but at the same time, in exactly this matchup, he killed us this year, even when he was with Houston. Mm-hmm. And we just don't play great against front court players. And so Zubats was a problem for us last year anyway. And yeah. now they have Boogie Cousins as well, like in, in reserve. And it's just like good grief. So they're going to have to yep. figure out something. They're going to have to be more physical inside and rebound because if you're letting him off the bench kill you, you're probably in serious, serious trouble anyway. Yeah, that's something we – I mean, we need to address, and it's good that we have the bodies that we do, um, but, you know, we still manage to find ways to have, let these big men have career nights against us. But uh, based on that uh, closing five, what would you – who would be your closing five for the Mavs to match up against that? I mean, Brunson, Luca, would you KP. Want to, would you, you want to keep Brunson out there to? Yes, okay. I, I would have Brunson, Luca, KP. Who's he guarding? Who's Brunson guarding? Rondo. Yeah, right? Rondo. Yeah. I'm and, thinking about this like literally on the fly. Yeah, uh, and then you would have to put Luca at that point on Morris. Morris, yeah, probably on Morris mm-hmm. again. But then who do you put on Paul George? Dorian Finney-Smith? Or do you want to save him for Kawhi? Because you got Maxie and you got Dorian Finney-Smith. If you're fully healthy... It, enough, that's all, it all depends on how Maxie is feeling. Okay. So if that's if the Maxie, case... If then, Maxie's good to go, Maxie's part of my closing five. Yeah. I probably will put him on... I probably will put... I probably will put Maxie on Kawhi. Just, hey, use your length. And right. hope that he misses. <laughs> like, and um, I think your closing five is basically your starting five, with the exception of Hardaway and Brunson swapping. That that's just my thoughts on it. And if you're chasing in the closing moments, maybe it's different. Maybe you do have Hardaway out there. But I think yeah. if you're in a back and forth, like one or two point game, or something like a one possession game, uh, I think I'd rather have Brunson out there for the total package he's bringing yeah. and the orchestrator and everything. So. Yeah, it's it'll be interesting, and we'll we'll definitely be doing these. I want to do throughout the postseason, however long that is. I want to do uh, <laughs> us record just like this. Doesn't have to be as long, but us jump on and at least give our initial reaction to the games, and then uh, upload it that night because w- there's going to be win lose whatever. There's going to be a lot of interest around it and people are going to want to know and so i don't want to wait until the following day or afternoon or something to yep. to get something out there so we'll try and tighten that up and do that but it's uh it's exciting there are so many storylines floating around this series and we we touched yep. on several of them but i i don't even know that we we covered everything you know it, it's really an impressive from a from a writer perspective, hey, it works for me. <laughs> from a writer perspective, <laughs> there's plenty to dig into, and I've been trying to do that this week with the the three or four different articles I've already put out on the site. But we'll see, man. Uh, let's see. Anything you want to add before we wrap up? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, so. I think that's about it. Terrence Mann comes to mind. That's another guy we need to look forward to. That's another guy that's probably going to throw on Luca. Then I'm thinking, of, like, I'm really trying to think about what are some bodies and some chess pieces that the 
Clippers are going to use versus what can we use. Are we going to see Josh Green? Probably not. But he definitely had some uses last year. And maybe he can be a change of pace. Um, and I think you know, if you're about stagnant in a game, you might see him get injected in there just to bring some yeah, energy and try and wake yeah. things up. But yeah, yeah I think it'll be very, very awful. limited, if at all. Yeah, I wish he got more playing time. We need, we definitely need his energy and, and his length. Um, but other than that, man, I, I think that we pretty much covered it all. Hopefully, I'm a little rusty. I haven't really talked about anything sports. I try to set up a podcast. Still working on that. I think I'm going to start at the beginning of the off season. Okay. Um, just so I can have a, a good starting point with a lot of stuff to talk about. And I'm not coming in midway of the season. Um, and so just keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then whenever Derek wants me to come back, I'm definitely able and willing to whenever you can, for whenever sure. he will, he's wanting to let me come back and talk Mavs, man, this is going to be exciting. And also, uh, I'm not sure where you're at with, uh, actually seeing people face to face. I'm not sure if you're vaccinated or, you know, you just don't care, but I was actually trying to do a, um, a watch party. Okay. Yeah. But if like try to set up a place, I have to see how, how, uh, Twitter, if I can get enough people on Twitter to say, yeah, cause right. I'm kind of a celebrity on Twitter. Cause I had that one tweet where I got like 5,000 likes. Uh, likes and like 2000 retweets. I was I mean, I nice. literally, I don't know how people do it. And I have to literally turn off my notifications on Twitter for a couple <laughs> days i'm like bro first of all the thing was the thing that i said wasn't that freaking like pro profound i think what they said was i forgot what the tweet was that i i kind of clapped back to there was like um uh they were saying oh the the look on the look on nba twitter's face when they realized that uh some somebody went to back uh, went to the playoffs back to back with no all-stars on their team and I was like, oh, I wonder what NBA Twitter is going to do when they found out that Dirk Davinsky yeah. won a freaking championship without another all-star on his team. Uh, and he's one of only like four or three or four people since 2000 to do that. So hmm. with, with Ben Wallace being one of them, that's pretty no, no one else on No one else on that uh, Detroit team was uh, voted as an all-star except for Ben Wallace. And of course, nice. Tim Duncan in uh, 2003. Uh, and I think LeBron was one. Uh, yeah, LeBron in 2003. You talking about the 07 Cavs? No, it was the. When did LeBron do it? Uh, it's fine. It doesn't. It, it's not anyway, important. <laughs> anyway, but still. Yeah, so I, I said that. And like my Twitter that like Blew went up, crazy. Yeah. And I was just like, that's not that pro profound and right all these notifications are annoying <laughs> so right. i had to i had to turn off notification on twitter so i know i feel to be a celebrity so <laughs> i'm about to get me some security and get me some sunglasses that i can wear in, indoors and go straight hollywood on you guys fair enough <laughs> well we'll definitely do it again and we'll set up uh some more some more live streams as well but uh cool beans Guys, be on the lookout for that. Check out when uh, when any podcast and everything goes live. We will be sure to plug all that for sure. And uh, until the next time, guys, remember, like the video, drop a comment, subscribe. Annie, do you want to hit the tagline or do you, do you remember? It's been a minute. Bro, I got this. Okay. And remember, every prospect. God damn it. Every legend was once a prospect. <laughs> it's How long do I have to banish you? <laughs> it's been a long time and remember every legend was once a prospect peace so-